Last week, I watched the Jeff Keighley Awards. After a mountain of advertisements for games that did not come out this year, the lights dimmed and it was time to start giving out trophies. With giddy excitement, our host announced the presenter of the first award, Al Pacino. You know, the guy from that Dunkachino commercial? The actor was well received. Heck, international movie star Lea Seydoux pulled out her phone to film him walking out. Yet, I found Pacino's inclusion rather odd. Usually the winner of last year's award presents this year's, as was the case in 2021 when previous nominee Ashley Johnson and winner Laura Bailey got up on stage to award Maggie Robertson best performance for bringing to life the uh, larger than life figure of Lady Demetresque. Why the sudden shift this year? Was Maggie not available? I don't think so. It's obvious why Pacino was invited to ramble about how he doesn't play video games. It gave legitimacy to the entire show. Dunk Kuhn is no slouch after all. He's a decorated actor who Keeley described as one of the great actors of our generation or any other. Praise that isn't unearned. The dude's a legend. His presence indicates that games are a serious business because serious actors come to our award shows and wax on about how these performers elevate the medium of video games to a new height. But I don't buy it. That's not the whole story. As wonderful as Christopher Judge is as the God of War or Laura Bailey as The Last of Us, are video games a lesser art form without them? Absolutely not. Scarcely a game on the Super Nintendo has voice acting. Does that make Final Fantasy VI or Earthbound less moving? Does no star in the recording booth make Super Metroid less interesting or Donkey Kong Country less beautiful? If you believe those games aren't art, no performance or Al Pacino cameo is going to change your mind. So why really was Al Pacino at the Game Awards last week? because video games are self-conscious. The industry, despite massive success and billions of players, doesn't believe in itself, doesn't believe they've made it, doesn't believe that video games are art. They crave validation, whether from Pacino, Brie Larson, or Keanu Reeves. Frankly, I find it pretty sad. We don't need Al Pacino to tell us video games have interesting stories. We don't need Keanu Reeves to tell us we're amazing. We don't need Roger Ebert to tell us games are art. We already know we're interesting and amazing and artists, so these figures, titans of their own fields they may be, can't make it true. Yet, next year the same thing will happen. Chris Pratt, Jennifer Lawrence, or a resurrected Orson Welles will pop on stage and pay lip service to how games are art, and everyone in the audience will clap and cheer, wondering, have we finally made it? The answer's been here all along. They're just too nervous about their own success to see it. I'm captivated though. How did we get here? Why are video games so self-conscious? While video games may feel the need to lean on cinema's prestige to add artistic weight to their belt, it's not like movies were throwing around cultural influence a hundred years ago. In fact, the film industry was once as self-conscious as video games are now. Jeffrey Noel Smith dedicates a chapter of his very short introduction to the development of cinema as art, explaining that in its early days, not many people saw films as an artistic medium, and those that did mostly believed it had the potential to be art, which it had not yet achieved. The French classified it as a second-rate form of entertainment, and the US Supreme Court and Mutual Film Corps v. Industrial Commission of Ohio ruled motion pictures were business, pure and simple, more akin to a circus or zoo than a vehicle for speech. One justice even argued, Films are mere representations of events, of ideas and sentiments, published and known, vivid, useful, and entertaining, no doubt, but, as we have said, capable of evil, having power for it, the greater because of their attractiveness and manner of exhibition. That 
capability of evil was enough to deem cinema an inartistic, inexpressive, and unprotected form of speech. I've seen some pretty awful flicks in my time, so while I can't argue that movies can't be used for evil, the idea that they wouldn't be protected under free speech or even be considered art seems pretty absurd. But just like with video games, cinema was not born believing itself art. It took time to develop a sense for what this whole movie thing was about. In that time, film was just as self-conscious as video games are now. Noel Smith explains that filmmakers first tried to borrow from more established art forms to show their artistic merit. Whether producing simplified Shakespeare plays, putting established stage actors on the screen, or adapting popular novels, each was just a different version of putting Al Pacino up on the stage at the Game Awards, a hopeful ploy that this move would increase the legitimacy of the art form. It didn't work. No one was convinced moving pictures were art just because they saw a 12-minute reel of Hamlet starring a famous London stage actor, and no one cares or remembers those transitory works today. Ultimately, cinema had to lean into what made it different than other art forms to establish cultural legitimacy, an idea put forward by Ricciardo Canuto in his essay, The Birth of a Sixth Art. Canuto described cinema as having a liveliness, a temporality, a life, unlike the stillness of paintings or statues. For him, this trait gave unique value to cinema's audience. While he felt cinema had a ways to go before it realized its potential, he concludes the piece by arguing, The cinematograph renews more strongly every day the promise of such great conciliation, not only between science and art, but between the rhythms of time and the rhythms of space. By this, he meant that cinema contains the possibility to synthesize many modes of expression previously thought separate, placing them together for beautiful effect. Turning toward our topic of conversation, games have the ability to synthesize things cinema could only dream of, if only we'd embrace those possibilities rather than try to emulate other art forms. Television struggled with the same growing pains as cinema. For a long time, TV wasn't considered art because it was just a tool, a means by which to broadcast real art and other stuff across long distances. Many were resistant to calling TV art because of its similarity to cinema, which was considered the superior of the two. We can also see attempts from television to emulate the cinematic style in order to curry the favor of audiences and be deemed art. Eventually, like film was able to distance itself from theater productions, television showed it had its own potential separate from its sister medium, and eventually proved itself to be an art form as well, despite resistance from most cultural critics. The point here is simple. What video games are going through is not particularly unique. No art form hits the ground running. While each one was capital A art from the moment it was conceived, None were perceived as such until much later. Understanding a medium as art requires both foresight, or the ability to look ahead and find clues a medium might develop into an art form, and hindsight, or the ability to look back and see the progress that medium has already made. Video games have been around long enough, and it's exceedingly easy to see they succeed in both fronts. But the issue isn't that the video game industry doesn't consider their work art, the issue is that they don't seem to believe it. And that's how we get to some of the unique ways video games are self-conscious. The games industry grew up in a rather bizarre way relative to other industries in that aspects of its course were far more directed by commercial concerns. Yes, cinema and television are also capitalistic products, and many of their first artistic breakthroughs were commercial successes as well. Games, though, took a rather strange route. Demographically, many early video games catered to a young audience, purposefully donning the mask of a toy to move units. While we can argue whether a G.I. Joe or Barbie doll is art, which they are, the moment a potential artistic medium purposefully makes company with them, it debases itself to more mature audiences who have the cultural capital to actually consider a medium art. Video games were a victim of their own success in a way. By becoming a breakout phenomenon through commercial pursuits, particularly arcades, they represented an art form with no easy corollary. 
television could be compared to cinema. Cinema could be compared to theater. Theater could be compared to poetry. Arcade games were most analogous to pinball machines. Pinball may seem innocuous to you now, but it wasn't great company at the time. Many considered it a severe vice worth criminalizing, not a distinct and important art form. As a result of its early monetization and demographic strategies, video games found themselves in the unenviable position of being both potentially dangerous and for kids. Neither helped develop his status as art. Though that's not to say Pac-Man or Donkey Kong aren't art, they certainly are. Meanwhile, gems like Colossal Cave Adventure, one of the first text-based games, proved video games could adopt the fixings of literature in a uniquely video gamey way. In reality, if there's some interesting thing you feel only video games can do, you can probably find a game from gaming's first 15 or so years that does that thing. For a long time, the games industry pigeonholed itself as for kids, and each year that went by built up games' anxiety about its own artistic merit. Even for its most ardent believers, it couldn't have been easy to see most games marketed to an age bracket closer to diapers than a college education. Though, two famous artistic mediums did take this path, comics and animation. Both of them still find themselves under siege as artistic mediums, despite attempts to break their culturally reinforced holes. Both tried to break out by embracing adult themes and violence, but for many audience goers, these diversions only reinforced their childlike appearance because sex and violence are developmentally stunted ideas of mature. Just last month, Bob Chapek, CEO of Disney, implied that animated movies weren't for adults. While I know they mean well, these statements undermine the artistic legitimacy of these forms by suggesting their appeal is only to an adolescent demographic. The history of games retreads these steps from violence and sex to the M rating. In their teenage phase, i.e. the 90s, games tried to convince their audience of legitimacy not by examining and reproducing what makes their art form unique, but by imitating what a child might think of as adult. Yet, video games received far more pushback from the broader culture for their attempts at mature theming than other mediums because of violent events such as school shootings. Like the Supreme Court deemed cinema, it seemed that video games were capable of evil in the public eye, which undermined any attempt to define them as art. So games pivoted. Retaining their violent tendencies, they pushed toward a cinematic and artful presentation, which we can find in advertisements like the Gears of War Mad World spot, or heavily curated experiences like Uncharted and Heavy Rain. I'm not saying these are bad games, but their embrace of a cinematic feel reminds me of something Canuto said a hundred years prior about cinema. Arts are greater the less they imitate and the more they evoke by means of synthesis. It's safe to say some of these games blur the line between evoking the cinematic form and simply imitating it. Video games are old. Pong turned 50 a month before Al Pacino stepped on that stage. And yet, we're still circling the wagons, bringing the Dunkachinos of the world into our camp to prove, not to idiots who don't care about this conversation, but to ourselves that games are a valid artistic exercise. It's time we drop the act and embrace that games are art, and have always been art. Pong was, and still is, art. It didn't need Christopher Judge, cinematic graphics, a moving narrative, or any other bells and whistles. Just two paddles, a dotted line, and a mobile square. Pong is beautiful in its simplicity and how it begs you to engage with it, tell your own story, find your own meaning within this plaque abyss. That's beautiful. That's art. I am hopeful that we can get to the point where video games' legitimacy is self-assured. And even the Game Awards gives me signs for optimism. While the Nebulous Games for Impact Award still perplexes me as a self-conscious way to legitimize games, the Game of the Year surprised me. I didn't have a dog in the race, but the difference between the two biggest competitors for the award emphasizes the difference between self-confidence and self-consciousness. God of War is great, and I don't have a PS5 so I can't play Ragnarok, but it's certainly a cinematic and mature attempt at a video game, one which tries to split the difference between cinema and games and its construction. 
that's great. I'm happy the game exists, and maybe it's even better than its competitor. But Elden Ring, for all its flaws, doesn't try to imitate other art forms. It's weird and esoteric, unabashedly a video game's video game. The fact that a game like that can win Game of the Year means we're finding some self-confident footing in these strange, artistic waters. I am Error, who also believes this video essay was a unique piece of art, signing off.